This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Haymarket Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Bit Tyrants, The Political Economy of Silicon Valley by Rob Larson. For fans of corporate fairy tales, there are no shortage of official histories that celebrate the innovative genius of Steve Jobs. Liberal commentators who fall over themselves to laud Bill Gates's selfless philanthropy. Or politicians who tell us to listen to Mark Zuckerberg for advice on how to protect our democracy from foreign influence. In this highly unauthorized account of the Big Five's origins, Rob Larson sets the record straight. Those readers unwilling to smile and nod as every day we become more dependent on our phones and apps to do our chores, our jobs, and our socializing can take heart as Larson provides us with maps to all the shallow graves, skeleton-filled closets, and invective-laced emails that big tech left behind on its ascent to power. Larson's withering analysis will help readers crack the code of the economic dynamics that allowed these companies to become near monopolies very early on. And, with a little bit of luck, his calls for digital socialism might just inspire a viral movement for online revolution. Bit Tyrants, The Political Economy of Silicon Valley, by Rob Larson. Out now from Haymarket Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Gramsci famously wrote, quote, The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old world is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. But The thing with being in an interregnum like this is that it is so hard to know what its shape and direction might be. One might even find themselves wondering if it will ever really end if this isn't an interregnum but the new world. The symptoms have become so unexpected and morbid. What's certain And the fact that this is cliché doesn't make it any less true, is that the future is uncertain. We can't shrink from engaging it. This is a moment when all that is solid melts into air way faster than even under what were already pressure cooker conditions. The capitalists and nationalists and racists and eco-nihilists shouldn't be so confident that they'll remain in control. They are, however, very much trying to do so. In the U.S., the right is claiming that attempts to address capitalism's ecological crisis as part of our response to what is in reality a bioecological crisis of capitalism amounts to an underhanded politicization of the crisis, even as they use the pretext of saving the economy to rescue rich people's portfolios. And it's not just the right— When Joe Biden debated Bernie Sanders, Biden charged that Bernie's demand that we fix the fundamental sources of economic and health insecurity that are now exposing people to mass death was wrongly politicizing the crisis. We must powerfully connect these dots now because the radical right and center alike are arguing that a crisis means that talk about fundamental transformation is verboten. And so to let the economic and health harms of this crisis follow the dystopian contours of our new Gilded Age. A state always ready to lock someone up, deport them, wage war is so absent when and how we need it most. And so the market, backstopped by government, is running the crisis response. Trump refuses to use basic federal powers to coordinate the distribution of much-needed ventilators, while he and countless other conservatives now demand a human sacrifice to satiate the market. But 
whatever happens, there will be nothing normal about any attempt to return to business as usual. Today, I'm interviewing Grace Blakely, the author of Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization, on the economics of coronavirus. We are in a war of ideas embedded within a conflict over power, and Grace puts this all in historical context. Critically, in her book, Grace explains how John Maynard Keynes's ideas required a major change in power relations to become enacted, which is what the increasing power of organized labor in the early 20th century accomplished. The same goes for the neoliberals who took charge afterwards, hitching their ideology to capital's counteroffensive against the post-war settlement. Neoliberal luminary Milton Friedman identified the importance of developing, quote, ideas lying around that could be picked up in a moment of crisis like this as power relations become more contingent and old ways of doing things become discredited. This interview with Grace is an overview of the global economic issues presented and made manifest by the coronavirus crisis. This weekend, I'll be posting an interview with New York Magazine writer Eric Levitz, looking back at the past week of economic policymaking and politicking in Washington. Before we get started, I really do appreciate that you, our listeners, make this podcast possible by contributing at patreon.com slash the dig. For At least the next few weeks, we will be doubling down on content production to provide you with the analysis that you need to help change the world. We need ideas lying around, and we need organizing and power to make those ideas into a new world. We are trying to do our part here at The Dig. We also, of course, have a left-wing book or books to send you in the mail if you contribute at least $10 a month. If you do have a stable source of income right now, Please contribute what you can at patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. What's more, next week I will be putting out a call for pitches for a limited time audio series on the coronavirus crisis, reporting and storytelling on what's happening now. So stay tuned for that. Okay. Here is Grace Blakely, a Marxist economist and the author of Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. She is a staff writer at Tribune Magazine and sits on the Labor Party's National Policy Forum. Grace Blakely, welcome back to The Dig. Thank you for having me. We are entering an economic crisis that will be at least as serious as the Great Recession and perhaps as bad as the Great Depression. And I feel like this question of just how nightmarish the economic situation might get is often discussed as though it solely depends on how devastating the disruptions and shutdowns caused by coronavirus and the public health measures necessary to control it turn out to be. And of course, that will play an important role. But we were already heading toward a recession before coronavirus hit. And so my question is, to start, doesn't the depth and severity of what we're entering also depend on what pre-existing contradictions in the global economy this virus will suddenly make manifest? And if so, what might that mean? Um, I couldn't have framed that question better myself, actually, because, yeah, you're absolutely right. I've just written a piece drawing on another piece I wrote a year ago, which was called The Next Crash. I wrote it for The New Statesman. And in that piece a year ago, I basically outlined some of the biggest potential threats to to the global economy. And those were so a slowdown in growth in China that looked like it would continue increasing financial instability, particularly in emerging markets a massive buildup of uh, of private debt internationally and a a trade war potentially catalyzing something and 
the uh, potential increases in, in monetary policy that we were seeing as central banks started to raise interest rates and unwind quantitative easing. Now, at that point, I was like looking at the dynamics of the business cycle, uh, looking at what economists call kind of the potential for for downside risks. So things that exist outside of the dynamics of the business cycle that gives us a recession predictably every 10 to 15 years. Um, those shocks that exist outside it, what were the risks associated with those? Obviously, you can never predict as we now can see. But, you know, ultimately, we do tend to get a recession every 10 to 15 years. And it's generally brought on by, you know, sometimes it's brought on just by the internal dynamics of the business cycle. Sometimes it is brought on by a shock that triggers a downturn at the at the top of the business cycle. So what we've seen now is really, you know, slightly early, because if you were just looking at the business cycle, you'd think maybe two or three years ahead, you know, there were some economists that were saying 2021, 22 looks like the time that the US might go into recession. Some were saying slightly earlier, but that tended to be the kind of um, the the safest bet. So this exogenous shock, as it could be termed, as economists would call it anyway, has tipped us definitely into an early recession. But there were all those warning signs that were around before. And those kind of pre-existing factors will definitely determine how this situation plays out. Now, of those factors I mentioned, you know, really, you can link each and every one into what is going on. So firstly, thinking a little bit about China, right? So China, the recovery from from the financial crisis uh, all over the world, a huge amount of it was driven by this massive stimulus package implemented by China that uh, was worth up to about 20% of GDP at its peak. And that really dragged a lot of the global economy out of recession, along with, uh, to an extent, the American, um, the stimulus of the American government. And it's primarily, it's really pulled China from a, an export-led growth model to an investment-led growth model, where you've had state-owned corporations, the state itself, uh, local governments, um, all investing huge amounts. So you've had, you know, the emergence of these amazing high-speed railways, you know, the building of all these new towns and things. And what we started to see- Infrastructure. Like, yeah, what we started to see one or two years ago is the steam come out of that a little bit. So um, on the one hand, financial conditions got a little bit unstable. Um, I won't go into that too much because that's a whole thing in and of itself. Uh, but also um, growth started to, to slide a little bit. So the fact that this obviously has centered in China has obviously tipped the Chinese economy into a, into a recession. And I think a lot of the, the, the questions that people are asking as we come out of this, looking at like what will happen um, in the recovery is, are we going to see another stimulus package from China? And the big consensus there is probably not. China is probably not going to take it on its shoulders to pull the global economy out of recession again when this is all over. The other thing that's linked into that is that China became, partly as a result of the stimulus program, hugely, hugely indebted. Now, part of that was the debt of state-owned corporations, municipal gov uh, local government debt, but part of it was, was private debt, household debt, private corporations, whatever. A lot of it has ended up in China's shadow banking system, and that was cited by Mark Carney in 2018 as a massive potential risk to the global economy. You've also got, you know, I, I spoke uh, a little bit earlier about like private debt throughout the global economy. We have a, a private debt burden three times the size of global GDP at this point. And a lot of that is in China. Some of it is in other emerging markets. A big portion of it is still in the UK, the US, where you have huge corporate debt bubbles in both of those economies, household debt in places like Australia, Canada, the Nordic countries also has soared since the financial crisis. And the thing that this crisis potentially threatens is that because it either leads to a substantial reduction or the complete evaporation in people's incomes, it means they can't pay their debts. And when you get into a situation where people can't pay their debts, suddenly you're in this kind of Minskyan crisis that you started to see develop in 2008. Although here, the, the likely trigger would probably be corporate debt rather than household debt. Um, although there are that, that would vary depending on the economy that you're looking at. So corporations lose all their incomes. They can't pay their debts. They start defaulting. They sell their assets in order to pay some of their debts. That sends asset prices down. Um, and this creates a kind of self-reinforcing cycle where asset prices have fallen. So that means that the assets of certain firms, even in the banking system, relative to their liabilities start to fall. And you start to see potentially an issue of, of firms uh, becoming insolvent and potentially uh, vulnerabilities emerging in the banking system as well. So that's a kind of worst case scenario you can imagine. And that's where the links exist between the previous model, 
as in, you know, the problems that existed in the economy before and what is happening now. There's also something to be said about monetary policy in the sense that it was kept very, very low, largely because the recovery from the financial crisis has been so terrible that you've needed really, really loose monetary policy to keep things going. But what that meant is that when this crisis came, policymakers couldn't cut interest rates as much as they would have liked to. There's an argument that cutting interest rates wouldn't have been effective anyway, seeing as that's supposed to stimulate demand for credit and people aren't going to be wanting to borrow, businesses aren't going to be wanting to borrow at this time. But it still did take a big kind of tool out of, of policymakers' recession fighting toolkit. So on all of those measures and a host of other that we other ones that we can get into, that yeah, that the crisis that we're seeing now definitely interacted with previous vulnerabilities that there were in the global economy. There's a lot there, and I want to get into it piece by piece. First, why so much debt you pointed to in the U.S., corporate debt in the U.K., household debt. In your book, you identify all sorts of different debt bubbles all over the world, sort of a nationally variable variety of debt with the commonality of it all being debt. Why Why is there so much debt and what does that have to do with these more general conditions of financialized global capitalism where we've seen such low investment and low productivity, what, what economists have called secular stagnation? I mean, I'll start just with the basic reasons that we've seen such a buildup of debt over the last 10 years. And that's primarily been because interest rates have been so low. So it's been very, very cheap for corporations to be able to borrow from banks, for example. And that's meant that this is fed into the productivity problem because it's led to the emergence of what some of economists have called zombie firms, where firms that should have gone under because they're not very competitive or they don't have good business models have been able to stay afloat by accessing loads of cheap debt. So those firms are often very, very highly leveraged and not running a particularly sustainable uh, business. Some of them have recently, you know, even before this crisis, they they started to to go under. So those are potentially some of the most vulnerable firms. And yes, the reason that they have been able to acquire so much debt is that interest rates have been so low, so it has been been very, very cheap. So that's one of the reasons. The other one, and it's related, is to do with with quantitative easing which has pushed investors into corporate bonds, which is slightly different. It's a different way of lending to a corporation. But basically, you know, this is another way that corporations can borrow. They can issue bonds, which investors can then buy. And because of quantitative easing. And just to pause you for a definition of quantitative easing is that that's central banks buying up assets. Yeah, effectively, primarily uh, their own state's government bonds. So they would create money and use that to buy government bonds, um, so treasuries in the US, for example, off investors, and then they go onto the central bank balance sheet. So central banks then own those those assets. And what that's basically done is pushed investors into other assets. So equities, for example, stocks and shares. This is, again, one of the reasons why you saw such a sharp, sharp fall in, um, in equity markets all over the world when the coronavirus hit. Partly, of course, because the crisis is very, very severe, but partly because they had so, so far to fall because equity prices were so overvalued because investors were being pushed into equities um, by quantitative easing. They've also been pushed into risky corporate debt. So corporate debt that is issued maybe by companies that aren't viewed by investors as that credit worthy. They've still been able to issue bonds. And because um, investors have been kind of reaching for yield, that is looking for investments, investments that are going to give them a high return in this in- environment of quantitative easing, they've, a lot of them have gone into uh, risky corporate bonds. Um, and this is a big part of why people think that there is something of a, a bubble in corporate debt, particularly in the US, but also in the UK. Um, so those are the kind of more recent factors that underlie the big explosion in, in corporate debt. I mean, low interest rates obviously also impact uh, household borrowing as well. But over the longer term, I mean, you've basically got two issues here when it comes to debt. You've got an issue of, of supply, the supply of credit and an issue of demand. So demand for credit. When it comes to the supply of credit, what I talk about in the book is I look at how in the 1980s, you saw a wave all around the world of bank deregulation and particularly the deregulation of, of retail and commercial banking. Um, And effectively, what that did is that it allowed banks to issue more debt than they had before. Um, So that previously there had been exchange controls, there had been credit controls, limits on the ability of banks to kind of create 
more credit. But those were steadily removed by a lot of different countries. I looked mainly at the UK and that allowed banks to increase their lending. You also throughout the 1990s and, and uh, noughties had what were euphemistically termed these kind of financial innovations that allowed banks to lend even more. So, you know, you had massive innovations in the shadow banking system that would allow banks to become, uh, well, to effectively become much more leveraged than it looked to the, um, from the outside. Leveraged meaning lending out a lot more money than they had. Yeah, effectively. It basically just meant that the ratio of their, their debts increased. Yeah, those kind of financial innovations that people will be very familiar with if they've, you know, seen the big short or read about the financial crisis allowed banks to issue more credit all over the world, really, but particularly in the US and the UK. So you saw a kind of ongoing expansion in the availability of credit throughout really from the 80s to about 2008. Um, This was a really central force driving economic growth, driving the expansion of the finance sector, and driving financialization in other sectors of the economy as well. So that's, you know, the supply issue that the, the credit was just much more easily available. There's also an argument that it was cheaper, because after the dot com uh, bubble burst in, in 2000, there was an interest rate cut then. And, you know, there are a lot of people who said that that interest rate cut, the Greenspan putt, as it's termed, Um, made credit kind of artificially cheap. But then there's also the demand side. So why did people in particular, why were they demanding so much credit? And there are really two elements to this. One, of course, is housing. And the other one is kind of unsecured credit. And housing is just the much, much bigger factor here. And there are a whole host of reasons why demand for mortgages picked up in in the 1980s. So you had a push by states um, by particularly the US and the UK, but again, states all around the world, you had a push towards home ownership. And that's part of what the deregulation of the, the banking sector was about. It was about making credit available for people so that they could get mortgages. Uh, in the UK, you saw the sell off of a lot of social housing, a lot of council housing. The state sold that off on the cheap and allowed people to own those homes privately. In the US, you obviously had big pushes uh, by the government towards creating you know, working class homeowners. Um, And this is obviously where eventually you get the emergence of those government sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and and Freddie Mac, that specialized in the kind of mortgage securitization that helped to cause the crisis. This was a real ideological push to create nations of homeowners because it was thought that these people would be the kind of uh, underpinning coalition that would support basically right wing governments. That was one element of it. This was a key feature of the neoliberal settlement of the 1970s crisis was deflating or at least curbing the inflation of wages and inflating assets instead. Exactly. And thus creating a new political, materially grounded political constituency through that settlement. Exactly. And that was the second point I was going to come on to, which is that, again, from the 80s onwards, and for reasons that I look into in my book, you start to see a stagnation in wage growth in a lot of different places. In the US, it's it's massive. So there was a study recently it's, it, that showed that wage uh, the in real terms and in purchasing power parity adjusted terms, the average worker is no better off today or was one or two years ago, no better off then than they were in 1979, which is staggering. In the UK, wages did continue to grow, but the rate of growth slowed every decade until the financial crisis. And then since then, it's become stagnant. And again, I won't go in too much as to the arguments as to why that happened. But in my book, I look at the restructuring of the economy, the erosion of of the power of the labor movement, the rise of financialized corporations that were much more focused on increasing shareholder value than they were um, kind of protecting workers and boosting wages. There are a whole load of interconnected reasons. But ultimately, that was another thing driving the demand for credit was that wages were were not rising as fast as they once had been. Um, And finally, there was just the fact that buying a house you know, it was felt, you know, a lot of people felt and still do feel that, that it is if you can buy a house, you would want to buy a house because it is a store of value. It means you're not throwing a lot of money away for uh, paying for rent. And when everyone thinks that way, and when they're able to take up mortgages to buy houses, then suddenly you start to see the dynamics of real estate speculation emerge because everyone wants to buy a house. So they take out a mortgage to try and buy a house uh, in the context of there being basically you know, the same number of houses, although there are obviously an increase in supply. You have more money, more people chasing 
a limited number of homes, which pushes house prices up. The people who get to buy those homes see the value of their house go through the roof. Everyone else looks at that and thinks, well, I mean, I should probably buy a house because it's going to make me a millionaire in 10 years. So this is the kind of dynamics. The same logic that propels stock market inflation. Yeah, it's it's basically about speculation in the context of uncertainty. People see a potential, um, you know, when people are optimistic about the state of the economy, they see assets rising in value. They pile into those assets. A load of them take out debt to pile into those assets until it creates a kind of self-reinforcing spiral of asset price inflation, which ultimately ends in the kind of Minskyan type downturn of the kind that we saw in 2008, where, you know, credit dries up, people start struggling to pay their debts, they sell their assets, asset prices fall, people become insolvent, etc. So yeah, that was another another factor driving that. So there are a whole load of really complex and interrelated reasons why we started to see the rise of that just that kind of debt. There's also corporate debt, unsecured private debt, government debt, all of these things start to expand dramatically from the 1980s onwards. And it's just a massive hallmark of financialization. And financialization also means that these regressive restructurings of the economy have profoundly affected how people have been made vulnerable to this crisis. It's not just that people are losing wages because they're losing their jobs, but they were this whole time using debt to make up for stagnant wages. And now with coronavirus, People have no wages and huge debts at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So there's two things here. Firstly, there's the issue of debt. Secondly, there's this issue of asset-based welfare, which I'll come to in a second. But yeah, I mean, you know, we've had a, in the UK, it was two years ago, I think that, I think it was 2017 or 2018, was the first year since 1987 that households as a whole spent more than they earned financing the difference with debt or drawing down from their savings. So at the moment, households don't have a lot of savings and a lot of them have significant amount of debts. There are something like 9 million households in the UK that have problem debts, i.e. debts that they probably won't really ever be able to pay off. So that's one issue. Obviously, as soon as wages start uh, start disappearing, then you get the problem of that being becoming unpayable. A big chunk of it is obviously mortgage lending and we've seen holidays for uh, for mortgages but not for other kinds of debt so that's potentially still a problem and just to pause you right there for one just to clarify one thing that means that a lot of the stimulus without any and the stimulus in terms of ubi type payments is obviously good and necessary but without any restructuring of debts people's stimulus is going to be going right into the pockets of creditors exactly Great. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, one of the issues, I think, with um, advocating a UBI without talking about the need for for banks, for other financial institutions to take a bit of a hit here. Whenever you get a problem of people not being able to pay their debts under the conditions of financialization, it's very rarely the creditors that take the hit. The creditors say, well, if we have to write off or write down debts that we've made in good faith, then we won't we simply won't make those loans. We won't take those risks in the future. So it was going to be worse for the economy if you force us to take a haircut on the, on this lending. Of course, you know there are a whole host of problems with that argument. Not least the fact that these uh, banks are given the right to issue credit by the state, and credit should really be seen as a public good that should be allocated based on kind of democratically decided social goals, not just whether or not a particular bank decides to take a risk because they want to make a profit. But yeah, I mean, we we need to start pushing back against that argument now because this cannot be a crisis again that is pushed onto the shoulders of working people and particularly the most vulnerable working people. Because at the moment, it looks like that's exactly what's going to happen. It's the self-employed, it's renters, it's the young, it's people with debts. It's, uh, you know, disabled people that are going to be feeling this much, much more than the better off. And I want to return to another thing that you mentioned in your opening response, the sense in which this new crisis has arrived before the response to the last crisis had ever really ended. Because, as you mentioned, with some adjustments, we've had extremely low interest rates for more than a decade. And so the monetary tools that dealt with the last crisis are now somewhat limited in terms of dealing with this crisis. And the Fed has has already taken the, I think, unprecedented step of 
providing direct support to not just banks, but also to small businesses and major corporations. How how did the way that this this last recovery took shape, creating what you call a, quote, lost decade, how did that reshape the economy? And what does that in turn mean for how this current crisis might play out? Yeah. So in terms of how the recovery happened, there are two sets of issues, really. There, there are kind of structural issues and there are issues driven by policy. So starting with the structural issues, you know, 2008 was obviously a crisis driven by debt. In the aftermath of that crisis, you had a lot of people trying to pay back their debts. And when you've got a lot of people trying to pay back their debts, that means that they're not going out and spending in the real economy. Similar sort of thing uh, for businesses. Maybe they can't access credit because risk because banks don't want to take as much risk. So they're not able to invest as much as they once did. And when you get this kind of what's called a balance sheet recession, it sucks demand out of the economy and potentially reduces investment, productivity, growth, et cetera, all of those different things. That was one factor. The other set, set of factors was, was policy stuff. So in the UK, you had austerity, which meant that at the same time as households were trying to pay back their debts, businesses maybe weren't investing as much. The state was also reducing its spending, which obviously just kind of sucked even more demand out of the economy. And what growth there has been in the UK since the crisis has largely been driven by consumer spending, which, again, over the last kind of five or so years has been driven by increasing levels of household debt. And, you know, there are, that combined with tight, tight fiscal policy in a lot of countries. So even when there hasn't been austerity, there's been very, very tight fiscal policy. So government's not spending that much combined with very, very loose monetary policy. So those things I was talking about before quantitative easing, low interest rates, which have basically driven up asset prices. So, yes, stocks and shares. Uh, but also housing, for example, in the UK, particularly in London, there's arguably a link between quantitative easing or between loose monetary policy and, and the house prices since the financial crisis. So that's, again, ex- ex- exacerbated inequality. You've had wage stagnation for a whole host of reasons, partly those demand based reasons I mentioned before, partly the complete and utter lack of bargaining power um, in the economy, partly austerity. Uh, But at the same time, you've had massive increase in asset prices. So the people who have the wealth have gotten richer and everyone else, particularly young people, have been massively left behind. And we know that unequal societies are societies marked by huge economic problems, not least the fact that when you have all that money stuck at the top, particularly when it's when it's all kind of uh, tied up in assets, it tends to mean that you get less spending because the wealthy spend less of uh, their income proportionally to uh, when compared to the the less well off. So all of those reasons are tied together. But there's one other big structural reason, which is perhaps more controversial, which is that just in the wake of the financial crisis, it was not obvious where future growth was going to come from. You know, arguably, we've been seeing this problem of capitalism looking to expand into new markets, looking to develop new technologies that would revolutionize production. And it's been hitting up against various barriers for 100 or so years. You saw this in the 1970s. Financialization was in many ways the answer to that. So, you know, financialization and and monopoly capitalism uh, in many ways, combined with a a new wave of growth emanating from, from China and Southeast Asia. After the financial crisis, it wasn't clear where that those next frontiers would be. Capitalism needs these places to expand into. Um, you know, there was obviously a lot of talk about the BRICS and that they would be the the kind of the, the drivers of future growth. And a lot of money fled into emerging markets, partly driven by low interest rates in the global north during this period. And that's created a whole load of other problems around sovereign debt in um, in emerging markets. But, you know, there was this narrative that these countries would be, you know, the future drivers of, of growth. But in recent years, over the last five years, in all of those countries, growth has started to stagnate. And you started to, again, come up against these questions of, right, so where is all this money going to go next? Where are all these investments going to go? We can't, you know, it might not be wise to try and invest loads in productive activity in the global north because there aren't, consumers aren't as wealthy as they were before and therefore might not be able to purchase the goods that are produced from that process, particularly when you have wages are relatively higher. Um, A lot of that obviously fled into China and emerging markets, but then you start to see the nature of the Chinese economy change, costs going up a little bit there. Where is the next frontier? Where can capital kind of expand into next? Not to be flippant, but it's a 
Ponzi scheme problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, all of those reasons are kind of kind of interlinked. Um, and I think that last one, basically, the problem of falling profitability is most linked into a, a more longer term Marxist picture about the imminent, you know, collapse of this system. You've already touched on this, but basic Keynesian tools to stimulate demand are no doubt necessary right now, but they don't seem like they'll be anywhere near sufficient, given that the collapse in demand amid coronavirus can't just be reinflated by putting money in people's pockets because, you know, for example, many of the services that make up a huge portion of global North economies and thus the global economy as a whole, simply those services simply won't be consumed no matter how much money people have. And I do want to emphasize that a lot of money should be put into people's pockets. But either way, people will not be going out to restaurants, movie theaters, taking cruises, vacations, no matter how much money is put into their pockets. So is this crisis, at least in the short term, unusual in that it requires not just stimulus to increase demand for ordinary consumption, but but also a, a more fundamental rethinking of the organization and orientation of production, what's being produced and for who? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is really a very, very unusual crisis because ordinarily when you were talking about a collapse in demand and you were looking at stimulus measures, you would be thinking, right, okay, you know, for example, the government's going to invest a load of money in building railways. That is going to increase the productivity of the economy over the long term. It's also going to employ a load of people now. Those people are going to go out. They're going to spend their money. It's going to you know, boost consumption, boost demand, et cetera. Building railways at this point is not only not really going to do much to re-stimulate the economy. You wouldn't want it to do much to re-stimulate the economy because you don't want people going out and spending loads of money and uh, boosting demand by, yeah, turning up to work every day working long shifts and then going out and spending their money on leisure, entertainment, whatever. You are actually actively trying to do the opposite of that. You are trying to shut down the vast majority of economic activity that in any other crisis you would be trying to stimulate. And what then remains is what is essential for human life. So obviously, we are going to need to make sure that we continue producing food. We're going to need to continue to make sure that we are uh, investing in our healthcare system, that logistics, for example, continues so that that food and, and basic goods can be transported around the world. And suddenly you start looking at what does look like, in some ways, a wartime economy, because you have production planned and specialized in a, a certain set of areas. But what also looks like, and I, this is James Medway's point, he wrote this in a piece for us for Tribune, an anti-wartime economy, because you're actively trying to constrict certain areas of, of the economy and stop certain areas of, of economic activity. And trying to spend loads of money at that point on some sort of Keynesian fiscal stimulus is obviously not going to do anything. It's not, it, you know, it's just going to run up against some of those other principles that you're obviously trying to do when you're enforcing things like like lockdowns. So it really is kind of unprecedented. Yes, we've had pandemics like this before, but we've never had pandemics like this in a complex, interconnected, globalized economy like the one that we have today. And that is creating all sorts of problems that we wouldn't otherwise have had to deal with. Corporations in in the US and I imagine elsewhere are rushing to leverage their influence so as to secure just massive amounts of government provided cash with the fewest strings attached possible. Where does what's happening right now, this renewed and utterly shameless expression of capital's dependency on the state that we witnessed so powerfully in 2008 and perhaps are seeing even more intensely today, where does that fit in to the broader sweep of the history of capitalism? What does it say about what capitalism is, the state that it's in today? You know, obviously, we don't quite know how we're going to look back on this moment in the future. But for me, it does feel like quite a significant turning point, almost like we're entering a new era of global capitalism. You know, if if the 1980s, really the 1970s, was the beginning of what I call finance-led growth, what some people call neoliberalism, whatever, 
And 2008 was the, mo- the, the moment that that model began to collapse. In the last 10 years, we've kind of been living in its death throes. Then what's happening now looks like it might trigger the commencement of a new era. And for me, that looks like what some Marxists have called state monopoly capitalism. And it's basically the massive concentration in, in, in corporations, in capitals. So you get the emergence of a couple of really big monopolies and their interests become increasingly fused with that of the state. And you start to get, you know, uh, Hilferding, who is an early Marxist economist, argued in a fairly extreme sense that at some point you would end up in capitalism with a general cartel. That is, you know, a, a group of the senior executives of the biggest monopolies, uh, senior politicians, central bankers, financiers, etc., who would basically plan how the economy would work. And, you know, obviously we're not there. There's there's powerful forces militating against the emergence of that kind of general cartel, and there have been. But we are getting increasingly close towards that place. Um, and I think this crisis could really be what pushes us over the edge. Obviously, we've seen partly to do with the dynamics of financialization, a massive increase in market concentration in over the last 30 years. So, you know, big, big monopolies, big conglomerates that control huge sec- uh, segments, huge portions of, uh, of output in their particular um, industries. And that's obviously accelerated over the last 10 years, particularly with the rise of those big tech monopolies, where there are just such significant network effects and advantages of scale that allow them to operate as they do. And you have started to see, as many Marxists predicted, that as a smaller number of people are in control of ever huger segments of the economy, politicians obviously have a huge incentive to think, what do these people want and how can we help them to almost compete with one another, states competing with one another over attracting these monopolies and over finding for their domestic corporations new avenues for for investment. This was obviously why Lenin called monopoly capitalism the same as imperialism. It was about rather than, you know, obviously firms were still to an extent competing with one another, but the main dynamics were between monopolies and their states and monopolies and other states looking for kind of outlets for investment. And we are increasingly, it looks like we are increasingly seeing that now, firstly, because this crisis is going to mean a massive increase in market concentration. Again, crises always tend to mean that the weaker firms get swallowed up and the, the, the weaker firms um, collapse, sorry, and they are swallowed up by the bigger ones. And you always see this during crises that you tend to get uh, an increase in market concentration. And at the same time, you're also seeing states step in and say, well, if some of these big firms are at, in danger of going under, we're just going to buy them up. Like that's, you know, what we exist to do. We don't really care that much about small businesses. We'll give them a couple of grants, whatever. But it's these big businesses that have, you know, are responsible for so much economic activity, so many jobs, et cetera. That's what we're really worried about. This looks like this is what might happen. You know, at the moment, governments are only providing loans. Most governments are only providing loans to corporations, which isn't going to help them that much because a lot of them are already really indebted. Some of them might go under. But when it starts, when this starts looking less sustainable, governments are going to have to start thinking about proper bailouts. That is nationalizing some of these companies or at least part of some of these companies by buying up equity in exchange for an injection of of cash. And the thing we need to be starting to think about then is, right, Okay, we are up against a very different beast than the um, kind of post-crisis neoliberal state. This is a state in which, yes, it's spending more money. And it itself is responsible for a, a, a more significant amount of economic activity. But that isn't necessarily a good thing, because the way that it is wielding its power is to promote, A, the interests of capital, and B, the interest of its its voter base. And that is primarily, under conditions of financialization, older homeowners. So you have this oligarchy that emerges at the level of the state, this, you know, what Hilferding might call this cartel, that is using the huge power that they have over economic activity because you know by this point monopolies and the state could would be responsible for a huge amount of economic activity and a national and b the global economy and they are using that power to advance their own interests so we've been having this fight for such a long time the state needs to do more we need more public investment yada 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 we have never really got through to that point where we've been arguing, actually, it's not just about the size of the state, 
it's not just about what how much the state is doing it's about in whose interest the state is offering operating you know we live under capitalist states and that is going to, going to become increasingly obvious um as this crisis wears on that the capitalist state is not a benign force and it is certainly not something that uh, the expansion of it that socialists should necessarily be celebrating and you identify if i remember correctly three key factors in terms of what sort of formations are taking shape under financialization first those who are profiting from the ownership of capital by receiving interest payments second those who are receiving rents due to ownership of of land and then third people who are receiving monopoly profits thanks to these increasingly concentrated conglomerates in in tech and other sectors why why are these three things what we've seen emerge so powerfully under neoliberalism or financialization or whatever we want to call it? Yeah, well, those three things are all versions of economic rents. Um, And economic rents, you know, there's different ways that you can define them. But largely, it's kind of, you can think of it as like extraction from the economy that doesn't produce anything. You know, the great ideology of capitalism is that you've got a guy with some money, he wants to make some money off that money. So he invests it in the economy, he creates jobs. And some of that capital is is paid to workers. Some of it is returned as profits. And then those profits are reinvested in order to boost economic activity again. And so you get these dynamics of, you know, expanding growth, rising productivity, et cetera. The difference between, between that kind of spending and economic rents are that rents are pure extraction. They're pure a pure transfer of resources from one group to another, from a less powerful group to a more powerful group. So you can think of this with land rents which, you know, don't generate new land. It's not possible to generate new land. They're just payments from people who own the land, from people who don't own the land to people who own the land. Tell that to the seasteaders. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, that is the one. <laughs> yeah, 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 that is the one <laughs> counterpoint. Um, yeah, but, you know, and obviously the more land you own, the more you could potentially basically gouge people who need to use that land. And that could be households, ordinary consumers, or it could also be businesses who need to use that land. Um to make things and sell things and whatever. So I think, you know, the you know, there are a lot of different ways of conceptualizing this. You can conceptualize it in terms of uh, what it does in terms of growth and productivity and, and that sort of stuff. But I think the, the real important thing to highlight here is that this is a way of extracting wealth when it has become harder to generate profits from the kind of you know, ordinary capitalist productive investment that I mentioned earlier. And it's a way of of kind of extracting value that depends upon an asymmetry of power. So if you're a big landowner, you can basically charge whatever you want for people who want to use your land. If you are a monopoly, then you can basically charge whatever you want for people who want to buy your goods. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Finance as well being the, the classic example of the ability to extract economic rents, partly because of asymmetry of information, partly because there are huge barriers to entry for for other firms that allow banks to operate in semi-monopolistic or oligopolistic situations where you get the emergence of these huge international universal banks that do, you know, retail consumer investment banking, uh, whose dominance cannot be challenged and so therefore can do things like charge very high interest rates to consumers on their overdrafts. All of these forms of economic rent stem from imbalances of power between basically people who are able to monopolize resources of one kind or another, whether that's land, capital, whatever. And those, you know, the rest of economy, the economy that is forced to pay those people for the use of those resources. Um, And this is, you know, different to Marx talked about this. He talked about the rentier, but it's different to the classic Marxist problem of exploitation. It is extraction. This is not. Uh, this is not about paying the worker less in terms of wages than the value that they create for the capitalist, uh, which is a, a process that generates value. This is about the the reallocation of surplus value that's already been generated through exploitation in other parts of the economy, generally uh, in the global south. Um, and yeah, this is this is really about making sure the people at the very top are able to extract more and more and more of the value that is generated in capitalist economies, even without generating more value themselves. 
And historically speaking, financialization and monopoly rents go hand in hand just as Keynesianism and curbing finance and capital mobility and curbing monopoly all went hand in hand before the destruction of the the New Deal post-war order. Yeah. And, and again, to go back to um, to Hilferding, he had some answers as, as to why this would happen. Um, and he basically, you know, Marx, obviously, all, all Marxists focus on the tendency of capitalism towards concentration. And this has to do with the uh, in- increasing capital intensity of production. So the fact that as capitalism develops, you have a declining organic composition of capital. So basically, there are few workers, fewer workers involved in the production process. And producing things tends to require ever more capital investments, so investments in machinery, etc. This tends to mean that those bigger firms that are able to undertake those big investments can outcompete smaller firms, particularly when you get to and this t- tendency accelerates when you get to moments of crisis, when those smaller firms tend to be swallowed up by the big ones, too. What Hilferding pointed out is that when you get to a certain level of, of capital intensity of production and a certain level of concentration in industry, then you start to see very, very close links emerging between industry and finance, because those industrialists that want to compete have to be able to mobilize huge amounts of resources to invest in machinery or whatever they need to invest in. And so who do they go to? They go to bankers. Bankers can lend them money, which allows them to do the investment they need to do to compete. They then can outcompete their rivals and you start to get you know, the, uh, the, um, the exacerbation of this tendency towards, towards monopolization. And then ultimately those firms not only need to become larger to survive in the financialized environment, but also more like banks themselves. Exactly. And that is the thing I think that perhaps, you know, Marxists to an extent looked at this when they looked at the emergence of joint stock stock companies, but there is less, you know, the, the, the kinds of dynamics that we've seen emerge over the last 40 years are quite novel in the sense that there are certain companies that undertake activities that you would expect from investment banks. So for example, some of the big tech monopolies, they have such huge piles of cash that they're sitting on. Of course, this is because they are, yes, very profitable businesses, but also part of their power and wealth comes from restricting production rather than constantly reinvesting. That's what a monopoly is. So they have these big piles of cash. What are they doing with them? They're investing them in financial markets. They're sometimes lending them to other corporations by buying up corporate bonds. That is the type of stuff that banks do, that investors do. Um, and it's now being undertaken by these big corporations. You also, you know, you can, there are so many ways in which, in which this is accelerated. So corporations are increasingly engaged in various forms of, of derivatives and futures transactions, exchange rate hedging, interest rate hedging. They are obviously very sensitive to equity markets in terms of how their stocks are are valued and all of corporate governance is really structured around this goal of maximizing shareholder value however that that can be achieved so for on a whole host of, of metrics you've really had the logic of finance the logic of lending and investing kind of infiltrate the modern corporation and that manifests itself in different ways depending on the company and depending on the 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 place but it is a trend that has really accelerated both in the kind of initial era of financialization between the 80s and 2008, and also in the era of kind of, you know, the growth of these big monopolies since the crash. And this crisis will no doubt reshape conditions that accelerate tendencies that we've already seen underway with companies like Amazon, Google, and, and Comcast, those companies that will not need to directly turn to the state for aid, but instead are making more profits than ever due to the bizarre situation that we find ourselves in economically. Exactly. You know, crises are some of those moments where what are called kind of economies of scale. So the advantages that you get from being big become really, really significant. And, you know, potentially what we're going to be looking at at the end of this crisis is just the complete and utter Amazonification of the entire economy. A lot of small businesses are going to go under. Even, you know, big supermarkets are going to struggle. Amazon is so big that it is going to be able to absorb a lot of losses. But more than that, it is going to be able to fill in the gaps that are generated by the collapse in these other 
industries. So it's going to, going to, going to become even more powerful. You're obviously going to see this with, you know, the Netflixes, the, the social media companies, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, all of these industries that have more or less characteristics of, of monopoly uh, or oligopoly are going to become extremely powerful in the coming years. And obviously, as they become more powerful, they're, they're the strength of the, re- the relationships of those senior executives and shareholders with the state becomes even stronger. Amazon and Walmart are each looking to add, I think, 100,000 workers right now, if I remember correctly. That's incredible. I didn't know that figure, but that is amazing. And yeah, it doesn't surprise me. These companies are probably going to be doing very well out of this crisis because, again, you know, this is the argument that's made by, yeah, Michael Rozwalski and Lee Phillips in there, the People's Republic of Walmart, is that these firms, part of the reason that they're so well adapted to these times is that they are experts in top down planning. A lot of what goes on within these firms is not dictated by the forces of supply and demand and market competition, but just by decisions made at the very, very top. These guys are good at planning. They are going to be good at adapting to a wartime economy. So, yeah, I am sure that that they're going to do very well out of this. In the U.S., we knew that we were going to have to fight over the economic response to ensure that workers and poor people aren't sacrificed for the portfolios of the super rich. But what I was not quite cynical enough to imagine is that Trump and conservative economists and other conservative activists would now be pushing to totally disregard public health officials and to reopen the economy soon, as soon as Easter, to get things back to a new and extremely morbid normal, sacrificing just an enormous number of human lives at the altar of the market. This has really, truly shaken me in a way that I wasn't shaken <laughs> before, <laughs> just in the last few days. What what do you make of this? And what, what ideas does this macabre cost-benefit analysis draw upon? And what sort of power relations in our society is it expressing? This is really one of the most fascinating things I think to have come out of the crisis is just the realization of the extent of some of these people's market fundamentalism. And what you've seen is, so, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I put out a tweet that just said, what you're going to see as as, as a result of this crisis is a battle between people who think that you can put a price on a human life and probably a very low price at that. And those who think that, you know, human life is sacred and we should be doing all we can to protect it. And there were so many people in the replies that were just like, of course, you can put a price on human life. Insurance companies do it all the time. And this this idea has seeped so deep into our collective consciousness that I then a couple of days later saw an article from The Times that said that it's actually going to be worse in terms of deaths if the economy shrinks too much because people will die because the economy shrunk rather than dying as a result of coronavirus. Now, firstly, that you know assumes a whole bunch of, of stuff around the idea that a recession happens in a certain way, and recessions have to happen in that certain way, and when they happen in that certain way, people die. That extremely regressive way that preserves the status quo inequalities to the greatest extent possible. Exactly. We do know that when recessions happen, you get an increase in things like suicides, right? But that isn't the necessary result of recessions. That's because people can't pay their debts and they resort to to suicide or, you know, they become depressed or whatever. Like that is not a necessary thing. So the idea that's presented in that way is is staggering. I also saw that thing that the Wall Street Journal put out that, you know, we can't let this crisis, you know, allow us to kind of turn away from the ideals of the free market, even if it means allowing people to die. You know, a lot of people have said this, even if it means allowing people to die, it's only 2% of the population. It doesn't matter that much. It's not worth sacrificing our free market principles for. It's staggering. And what is interesting about it is that whilst the powerful are not, you know, completely, but a big portion of them are united on this line, it is completely and utterly jarring to the vast majority of the population. When people see the Wall Street Journal, the Times, senior politicians coming out and saying this stuff, saying your grandma is worth sacrificing to protect the sanctity of the free market, it exposes just, you know, it it tears away the ideology 
that is placed over the free market economy, all about, you know, this is the most just system. This is the fairest system. This is the system that makes everyone better off and just really exposes the kind of brutality that is at the core of uh, of this this ideology. Marx would have a lot to say this because this is, again, about the, the symbolism of money that represents value being pushed into more and more areas of, of human life, being constantly expanded to colonize ever more areas of, of our society. And, he, you know, to the extent that you get to a point where literally someone's death, you can put a price on it. And it's the fact that that is, is unremarkable today says something really quite profound. But I also think that it's it's going to erode this ideology. The fact that these right. people are coming out and saying it's OK if people die as long as we can protect capitalism. That is it's not... going to become more remarkable. Yeah, exactly. Like that is not something that most people agree with. And the fact that we're going to be having this fight will allow us to say, look, this is what these people actually believe. Is this the kind of society that you want to live in? This is Sarah Jaffe, and you are listening to The Dig with Daniel Denver, my favorite podcast for thoughtful discussions on the U.S. left and beyond. And you can support it on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Planetary Mine, Territories of Extraction Under Late Capitalism by Martin Arboleda. Planetary Mine rethinks the politics and territoriality of resource extraction, especially as the mining industry becomes reorganized in the form of logistical networks and East Asian economies emerge as the new pivot of the capitalist world system. Through an exploration of the ways in which mines in the Atacama Desert of Chile have become intermingled with an expanding constellation of megacities, ports, banks, and factories across East Asia, this book rethinks uneven geographical development in the era of supply chain capitalism. Arguing that extraction entails much more than the mere spatiality of mine shafts and pits, Planetary Mine points towards the expanding webs of infrastructure, of labor, of finance, and of struggle that drive resource-based industries in the 21st century. Planetary Mine, Territories of Extraction Under Late Capitalism by Martin Arboleda, out now from Verso Books. There was this idea on the left that Trump might go full hair invoke socialist by embracing economic populism as policy and not as mere rhetoric and politics. And that, of course, has so far, for for a variety of reasons, proven to be a total fantasy because Trump I'll repeat, is considering the mass murder of especially elderly Americans to stimulate the economy. And and one thing that your book had had me thinking about is how this populist rhetoric coupled with pro-business reactionary policy is far from new with Trump. Neoliberalism has often been populist and premised on the populist argument that the people should rule no, no matter how much that was a pretext. And what neoliberal populists do is that they frame the market and property ownership as the means to create and enact this sort of popular sovereignty. Thatcher called for a democracy of property owners. Bush had his, I think it was called, ownership society. And in 1992, even Bill Clinton ran a populist campaign. What, what do you make of this kind of fear on the left that Trump would actually combine his right-wing nationalism with social democratic policies? And, wh- and what does it reveal that that's actually seems to have proven to be totally not what's going to happen? Yeah. So you had a, a similar sort of thing here, actually, in the States, re- in, the U- in the UK, sorry, recently with um, people saying, you know, Boris Johnson is going to be, because he won all these seats in the north of England in previous Labour constituencies, he's going to be this you know, populist, economically populist uh, prime minister who's going to do a huge amount for the working classes. 
Because he's only been loaned those votes. Yes, exactly. This is the idea. And there are some abstract arguments that we can we can go into as to why, as you say, kind of neoliberalism has historically always been premised upon this big and capitalism itself, actually. I mean, Marx right. talks about this all the time, the massive difference between the the appearance, the realm of appearances and what goes on kind of beneath the surface. Marx talks at the very beginning of Capital about, you know, the, the market being the realm of appearances and then going behind that to the hidden realm of production and that, you know, showing actually what goes on in capitalism. And today we live in a society where we are so just taken in by appearance and by spectacle that journalists and, and commentators and whoever take the rhetoric of these guys seriously and don't bother looking at, at what goes on behind it or beneath it. And that's why you get these narratives being spread even when they're so obviously not true but i think there's a more fundamental point here which is that states and governments have interest groups that they represent and this is something that is kind of denied or um or just ignored by the kind of political science that you get emerging in the kind of economics and economic policy that you get emerging in the 1990s and noughties which says you know there is a median voter the job of political parties is to capture the the vote of the median voter and they do so by figuring out what is the most preferred set of policies that everyone in society wants right it's a completely classless not even just class like it you know just does away with the idea of the interest group what we obviously know is that political parties represent interest groups and particularly they represent classes especially you know in majoritarian systems like ours You've got a, a primary economic divide where you have a party that is the party of capital, and potentially, you know, in the UK, it, we, you know, have the Labour Party, which was founded by the Labour movement, the representative of organised labour. Obviously, different in the US, but broadly speaking, th- those different parties en- end up representing different different interest groups. And what you what you see in in the nineties is in the UK the kind of severing of the links as the nature of class begins to change the severing of the links between the labor party and organized labor on the one hand and the working classes on the other you see a similar dynamic in the u.s although it's more complicated because obviously those links have never really existed in the same way and those parties have never really existed in the same way but today what we are seeing is when we are talking about the expansion in the size of the state that's happening as a result of coronavirus we're seeing these parties act in a way that is promoting the interests of their electoral base on the one hand, which is primarily older homeowners, and the people who provide them with the resources on the other, which is capital. They are representing a coalition of of capital and wealthy older homeowners. It's just that the, the reason that their behavior has changed is because the interests of those two groups have changed. So it's not that Trump and Johnson have suddenly realized that Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders were right and that they need to do loads more public investment because that would be the just and right thing to do. Do do Bernie and Corbyn, but combine it with hardcore racism, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, right. But that's not even, I mean, obviously the hardcore racism part, yes, but that's not even what they're doing. They're not doing a Corbyn and a Sanders. They are responding to the needs of their constituency. Capitalists need the state to lend them money and to intervene more in the economy. Right. Wealthy homeowners need the state to guarantee that they're not going to lose their homes. So we need to be thinking about what's going on right now in terms of whose interests are being represented. And, you know, this being a reconfiguration of the interests of basically sections of the ruling classes, not by saying the state's doing more, therefore we basically have socialism. But Johnson does seem to be taking a somewhat more heterodox approach than Trump, if I've read it right, proposed covering 80% of laid off workers pay and barring companies that receive aid from doing layoffs. I mean, that was after just, I think, like 10 days ago, his government was refusing to impose the entirely normal social distancing policies that were being imposed everywhere else because they were following some murderously harebrained herd immunity scheme up to the very last moment. But but, but now, am I right that Boris Johnson's approach is is somewhat more heterodox than than Trump's, who seems still committed to going back to Johnson's herd immunity scheme. What's happened, obviously, is that you have had the government step in and say, we're guaranteeing 80% of people's wages. There are big gaps. You know, the self-employed, 5 million self-employed people aren't covered. Um, Statutory sick pay is still too low, yada, yada, yada. But broadly, the government has stepped in to guarantee at least a portion of some people's incomes. 
That always had to happen. And if it doesn't happen in the US, I will eat my hat. There, ha <laughs> there is going to have to be some form of income support provided to ordinary people throughout this crisis, not just so that they can enforce social distancing, but so the entire economy doesn't literally collapse. Like that, you know, when you look at the proportion of economic growth and um, economic activity that is accounted for by consumption spending by households, it's huge in the US and the UK. Without that, you haven't got an economy. So, you know, I saw this really in terms of uh, Johnson attempting to you know, respond to this crisis in a way that was just basically economically rational. This is about saving capitalism. And I would be very surprised if you don't start to get at least some form of income support emerging in the US, because it would be disastrous if not. You know, not only is this going to mean a long term reduction in household spending capacity, it potentially means a bunch of people default on their debts and you get financial meltdown. One thing I was thinking about reading your your book in in the time of coronavirus is how the rise of neoliberalism and financialization, as you write, was premised on this idea that maximizing profit and shareholder returns was the best way to I don't know if this is how neoliberals would would frame it, but to maximize total social well being because the market left to its own ruthless devices weeds out inefficiencies. If market discipline causes workers to be fired from one industry or company, then employment could be reallocated to another industry where labor was in greater demand. And in this view, labor protections, unions, regulations, all of that simply make markets less efficient and thus, however noble the intentions, will lead to undesirable outcomes. How does this crisis, perhaps more than any other we've experienced, really highlight how absurd this sort of thinking in this sort of thinking is this this inability to this failure to substantively and straightforwardly address the question of what we are making and for whom it is being made? Yeah, you can come at this from so many different perspectives. I mean, you know, the Keynesians would come at this and say, Though those things that you were talking about, the fact that the market always ends up in equilibrium, that's only ever true over the long term. So workers may be laid off. That will lead. And we're to... all dead in the long term. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, or as yeah. it turns out, the short term, we'll see. But go well, ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Rethinking Keynesian. Like um, yeah. So, you know, there's this uh, idea of uh, it says law that supply always equals demand. So you get a load of workers that are laid off because there are more workers. Wages fall. So the workers get hired in another industry. Keynes steps in and says, no, you have the dynamics of uncertainty and liquidity preference, which basically means that when investors are uncertain, they want to hold cash. They don't want to invest, which means that even if wages are very low, they might decide we don't want to spend too much money on investment. So we're not going to hire them. And this is exacerbated by the fact that when you get wages being low, people can't buy as much of the stuff that the capitalists are producing, which again creates all these dynamics of demand that Keynes talks about. Marx also mentions this, this idea, but in less detail and without touching on things like um like uncertainty as much as Keynes does. But I think again, you know, the the Marxist response to this, and I think it's more profound than the Keynesian response, is to say, you're focusing on the market. What happens behind the market? All the ideology of capitalism is constructed on the basis of looking at the realm of exchange, looking at what happens when isolated in individuals bump up against one another in free markets, all of them having their endowments and, and deciding what they want to do. You know, Robinson Crusoe on his island deciding between coconuts and bananas, this sort of thing. <laughs> Mark says... Marx actually actively ridicules that passage at a really funny pass uh, part of Capital, of the, the thought experiment about Rousseau. But, you know, what what is going on behind this? What determines who comes to the market and how they come to the market and what their power is in the market? And of course, this is foundational to Marxism. It's the fact that there are people who own the stuff and there are people that have to sell their labor power for a wage. And that happens before, well, you know, as, well, it happens, yeah, it happens before you get into the question of markets because either you have this stuff and you can take you can take that power to the market or you don't and you take yourself you take your labor power to the market and obviously you know you then start looking at 
production and what goes on within the firm and economists treat the firm in neoclassical economics as a black box so they don't really care about what happens inside the firm they don't care about who has the power all this sort of stuff they just look at what the what goes into the black box and what comes out of the black box and again Marx says no if you want to understand capitalism you have to look inside the box you've got to look behind this curtain and go into the realm of production and that's where you see the inequalities and the inefficiencies and the irrationality manifest itself because obviously when you have a society where a tiny number of people own all the stuff have all the power are able to extract to exploit workers in production yes but also to extract from them through um the fact that they are selling them goods at a higher price than they should because they're monopolies rather they're extracting money from them through economic rents the fact that they you know workers perhaps bear a disproportionate uh, share of the tax burden and these guys aren't paying any tax you start to see how fundamentally irrational this kind of model is and when the crises do emerge they can generally be traced back to these kinds of inequalities and these dynamics that happen before you get to the point of exchange before you get to the to the market so really the answer to that question is they're not looking deep enough you know the neoclassical economist the neoliberal has constructed this perfect idealized world that even if it has a basis in some sections of reality, doesn't even come close to describing most of what goes on under capitalism. One major thing being exposed is how labor is valued under capitalism, which, according to neoclassical economics, is something that's efficiently determined by the marginal product of a worker's labor. But Marxists, of course, have always known that this is not the case, that in reality, profits are derived from the surplus value created by workers. What are we learning about the mystifications created under this exchange value governed system in terms of what work really matters when it comes down to what we need to survive in a crisis? Not only often high, more highly paid professionals like doctors and and less highly paid professionals like nurses, but really low wage workers at supermarkets, cleaning linens at hospitals, driving trucks, everything that is keeping civilization from collapsing. Yeah. (laughs) So this touches on a really, really profound and I think controversial set of issues within Marxism, which is really thinking about who counts as a worker, what counts as productive labor and where and how surplus value is extracted. So obviously, you know, the vast majority of surplus value is generated in the production of commodities, which tends to take place in the global South. And effectively, this means that the wage that a worker is paid is worth less than the value that ends up being produced in the production of that commodity that the capitalist can realize when they sell that commodity. So Basically, the worker is paid less than the value of, of for what they produce for the capitalist in the form of that commodity. And this is obviously something that takes place in commodity production. And you have in the global north a lot of economies that aren't really producing a lot of commodities anymore. Most of the things we need to survive, whether that's food or you know goods or whatever, are produced elsewhere. So a lot of that, I mean, the vast majority of that surplus value is being generated elsewhere in really horrific conditions uh, generally where workers you know in in China or parts of Southeast Asia are subjected to kind of you know Dickensian conditions literal um, suicide net conditions yeah literally that kind of thing um so then you have a question of right okay so what are we actually all doing if we're not producing surplus value if we're not producing commodities like where does the the value the money that circulates constantly, in the global economy and in the global north in particular, where does it all come from? Turns out it's podcasting all the way down. It's podcasting all the way down, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's all the value. <laughs> um, Sorry, go ahead. And I think, I think what you start to see is that, you know, Marx in Capital, he talks about the role of the manager, right? And how there are a certain class of workers that end up becoming managers and they effectively are paid slightly more and they exert the interest of capital in the factory. And obviously what you start seeing as capitalism becomes more complex 
um, and more globalized is that those managerial roles become more necessary because production is more complex. So there's all sorts of things you need to be doing, whether that's about organizing production itself, dealing with taxation, dealing with payroll, etc. Management becomes more complex and it becomes concentrated in a certain number of economies. So commodity production largely takes place far down the value chain. Managerial work, you know, work around um, how companies are financed, work around, you know, advertising. So the realization of surplus value, i.e. how you get to people to buy the commodities, um, all of these different functions end up being concentrated in the global north. And they largely are associated with higher wages in the same way that in a factory, the manager is paid a higher wage. But they aren't actually engaged most of the time, other than in certain cases, in producing any commodities. They're not producing really any new value. What you're seeing is a hyper exploitation amongst the people who are producing commodities. So they're paying even less than what you would expect, given um, you know, the average rates of, uh, of surplus value extraction in commodity production. And the excess, pro excess profits that that generates higher up the, the value chain are used to pay for management, et cetera. Now, there are big arguments about where commodity production ends and where it begins, right? Because you could argue that now commodity production is so complex that you can't really understand what happens in the Foxconn factory in China without having, um, without a view to what happens in, you know, Apple's headquarters somewhere else, or uh, you know, even during the in, in the middle of the value chain where they're thinking about I don't know how the company is structured, or you know, the advertising or whatever. And thinking about information as as commodity as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a whole issue in and of itself. And personally, you know, I, on the information question, I don't know where I stand on it. I'm still kind of exploring that, I think. And and there is also this question about, can we conceive as the worker in the Foxconn factory as qualitatively distinct from the worker who is working in advertising for Apple, because they're both in one way or another involved in the production of this commodity. It's just that this task has been separated up into so many different categories that these jobs are so, so very different. Or selling Apple products at the Apple store that were made in Foxconn. Yeah, I kind of tend towards the first view, which is to say that, you know, we are in this form of kind of complex capitalism that requires a certain number of functions that might be necessary to the realization of surplus value and the efficient organization of production, but aren't completely and utterly necessary for the production of commodities. And those managerial roles, which tend to be higher paid, are concentrated in the global north. And a lot of them like, are actually just bullshit jobs, right? I mean, yes, you can argue that we need some of these functions because of how complex capitalism has become, but a lot of them are what David Graeber describes as bullshit jobs, things that if you stop doing them, nothing would happen. Right. We're having a big experiment around that right now. Yeah, literally. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I think a lot of people are realizing like, wow, OK, the things that we need to survive are largely not produced by us. But they're also sorry, just to add, they're also the low wage services of the global north. They're, they're commodities not produced by us, but also low wage services in the global north that are necessary to support the social reproduction of the global north's managerial class, as well as everyone else who lives here. That was exactly what I was going to say next. So as well as production, you have social reproduction, right? And the labor that is necessary to reproduce the subjects who are either working in factories in China or, you know, working as managers in the global north. Um, and in the advanced economies, obviously, a lot of the, you know, the higher wages in those managerial professions support a huge and diverse services economy that effectively represents the outsourcing of a lot of social reproduction that used to take place in the home. You know, you're thinking about like hospitality, dining out, even certain forms of entertainment you can see in this way, um, care work. And then there's obviously the direct social reproduction of, uh, of reproducing and protecting the human being that takes place in the healthcare system. So yeah, these forms of like important and necessary social reproduction, which for a whole host of reasons to do with patriarchy, to do with, well, basically to do with pa capitalist patriarchy are systematically undervalued. Um, and even historically by Marxists have been ignored or, or undervalued. Um, we suddenly see our, again, what allow us to survive. So the combination of the production of commodities that play, takes place elsewhere 
and the the services that exist here that allow us to reproduce ourselves these are the things that we need everything else is often moving money around to make more money or um reorganizing companies to shift value up to the very top or reorganizing management to accelerate exploitation in other parts of the value chain you know it's all stuff that's based on the needs of capital rather than the needs of individuals and that's you're right it's interesting and it's it's profound and who knows what that realization will come to when people go back and think what is the point of me showing up to work every day when i know i don't have to the world isn't going to end if i don't let's get a bit deeper into the global economy when nixon ended the dollar's convertibility into gold in 1971 that ended the global monetary order that had prevailed since the end of world war ii And yet, remarkably, the dollar remained the global reserve currency. And you write that, quote, the real foundations of Bretton Woods had been exposed. American imperial power. The gold peg established at Bretton Woods was not the source of the dollar's value. It was, rather, you write, about geopolitical economy. For context, first explain how American economic and military power structured the global economy before and then after the the bread and woods era and then explain given what we know from that what might happen next given that u.s policy under trump which is often described as this retreat from the global stage is taking place alongside china's rise a dynamic that is very much accelerating in complicated ways as we speak, because a- after 2008, the U.S. and China led the global recovery, but geopolitics and the domestic political economies of both countries have changed and continue to change quite a bit since then. What does that all mean? <laughs> so, yeah, beginning with that question about Bretton Woods, so the fact that, it, you know, the basis of the system was really American imperial power, you see, you know, the Bretton Woods Conference, and I talk about this, you know, at length in the book, takes place over after the end of of the Second World War. And it's an attempt to reestablish a a, a global monetary system that can underpin a new wave of globalization that can basically create the kind of certainty and security needed to reestablish and expand global trade and, and global investment. And you end up in this scenario with the dollar being pegged to gold and lots of our other currencies being pegged to the dollar. And that obviously reduces or eliminates any risks associated with exchange rate movements uh, and provides kind of a level of certainty as well as restrictions on capital mobility. And the main battle lines that are drawn at Bretton Woods are really over, so firstly over what currency is going to be underpinning this, and secondly the rate at which all these different currencies are pegged to each other. So Keynes comes representing the UK saying we, we, the dollar shouldn't be, you know, the center of this system. We should have a, a new uh, kind of clearing system that's based on this idea that he has around Bancor. It should be a new kind of kind of currency thing that can be kind of that can basically act as the currency for clearing international payments. And this is defeated by the Americans who obviously want the dollar to be the center of this system, because if you are able to print the global reserve currency, print the currency that, you know, is the basis really of the international monetary system, you have effectively an endless amount of power. Because Keynes was like, let's do monetary Esperanto. And the US was like, no, no, the dollar, (laughs) English. (laughs) Yes, literally that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that's a really good example. And yeah, because the language example is is kind of similar when you get to the end, when you get to this this idea of what we end up with, which is the, the fiat currency. Because at the beginning, you obviously had the dollar pegged to gold, you know, for a number of reasons, not least the ideology at the time, which saw fiat currency as kind of scary and unreliable. Uh, the, the, the dollar is pegged to gold, which presumably is supposed to mean that the US government can't create too much money because it has to have the gold reserves to back it up. Now, of course, the gold was only ever a symbol and the US ends up creating all the money it needs and particularly all the money it needs to finance the war in Vietnam. And suddenly you get to the point where you realize there's so many dollars and there isn't enough gold to back it up. And so 
Reagan has to take the US off the gold standard. But at that point, it is like that language example of like English has spread all around the world. You don't have to enforce it. You don't have to have anything underpinning it. People just fall back on this because largely of the imperial structure that spread it in the first place. And you get the same sort of thing with the dollar that, you know, it has become the default global currency. It is what is kept in central bank reserves. A lot of other countries around the world are even dollarized. They have their economies dollarized and they use dollars themselves. And because of the power of the American state, these notes, as well as dollar denominated assets like treasuries, are seen as the safest assets in the global economy. You know, these things are not going to lose their value because America is not going to lose its, you know, its position as at the, at the top of the world system. And you see this take on a new form, I suppose, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, when all around the world, central banks are desperate for dollars, particularly in Europe. They need dollars to uh, be able to finance, to be able to support the domestic banks, which have obligations all over the world, many of which are denominated in dollars. So they draw on these swap lines. And Adam Tooze is the best person who's who's talked about this in, in Crash. And listeners can go back to the Dig archives for my interview with Tooze on just this as well. Yeah, he's he's great on this. Um, and he's great on the, the geopolitics of, of international finance, actually. So, yeah, you, you obviously get the system where the Fed is basically extending the like dollars through these swap lines to central banks all over the world that need it. And as Tooze argues, this really cements and consolidates America's power in the international financial system, even though this crisis had its origins in the U.S. and in U.S. housing market. And you are going to start seeing a similar sort of thing today, you know, there are going to be a lot of economies, a lot of central banks that are going to need to draw on dollars. And the Fed's already said that it's going to make those swap lines available. Again, there was some concern about whether or not Trump would actually let that happen because of his America first rhetoric. But he realizes at some point, you know, someone's made him realize this, how profoundly important this is for America's global dominance. The interesting thing, I suppose, is what is going to happen to this over the long term, because it's obviously, you know, written into the five year plans of the um, Chinese Communist Party that they want to make the renminbi the global reserve currency. Now, obviously, that's still a long, long, long way off. But again, you know, when you're looking at this, not in economic terms, but in political terms and geopolitical terms, in terms of where global power lies, then what happens next in terms of the balance of power between those currencies is obviously going to be determined by what happens next in terms of the balance of power between those countries. And at the moment, you know, America losing its global hegemony seems like a a far off um, fantasy. But I think this crisis and how it is managed will shape the stability and or decline of American power Because China obviously has the capacity and has the resources to deal with this in a way that few other states can. But for all the reasons that we've been discussing, you know, if Trump genuinely doesn't provide income support for workers, that would decimate the American economy. I mean, the American economy is very strong and it's going to take a lot to properly actually start eroding the basis of the fact that, you know, the American state is basically the state of global capital. But the way that this crisis is handled will change those dynamics in you know in the coming decades basically we are at a very unstable time not just for the global economy but for the balance of power between different capitalist states obviously to the extent to which you can even separate those things i think that's something that's that's very revealing is that while the us is trying to stigmatize and demonize china for domestic political purposes right now that china is engaging in public health diplomacy for international geopolitical purposes. Yeah, exactly. And the capacities of the Chinese state to deal with this and to deal with it so effectively in such marked contrast to the inabilities of other states to do the same is a real ideological power for for China. And yes, you know, America can say, well, that's just because they're authoritarian. 
But when people are, you know, seeing friends, relatives, neighbors die, the economy tank and, you know, fear rain, they might look and think, well, you know, that model doesn't look so bad. It potentially really expands and extends Chinese power. Even on that basis, on the basis of just pure self-interest, it would just be so unbelievable if you did actually not see any income support emerge in the US and not, and you didn't see kind of much more significant interventions in the economy by the state. Well, in terms of those interventions, not just domestically, but internationally, Tews recently wrote, quote, if we are to contain the fallout from the crisis, America's central bank must act as a lender of last resort, not just to America's financial system, but also to the entire world's. In 2008, the dollar shortage was confined largely to the banks of Europe and America. That is the Fed's historic comfort zone, the cradle within which it was born a century ago. The coronavirus explodes that 20th century framework and poses the question, how does America's central bank supply dollar liquidity to a polycentric world economy? Two's points to dollar debt incurred by corporations all over the place, like the Mexican state oil company Pemex, and also to quote Japanese and Taiwanese life insurers, pension funds, and postal banks, which have made huge purchases of American corporate bonds that are now collapsing in value because of the shutdown of global economic activity. And then, of course, as we've been discussing, there is China, which holds just an enormous quantity of U.S. Treasury bonds, which means that the, the future of the global economy rests in part on the cooperation of two countries that have in recent years under Trump been engaged in a serious economic war. So saving just one's allies, saving just the, the economies of one's allies makes about as much sense as saving just one country from coronavirus, because in both cases, borders won't do anything to protect us. Do you think that these these economic realities will overcome the ingrained geopolitical hierarchies and these perceived, if entirely delusional, perceived self-interests that go along with them? I doubt it. And the reason <laughs> I doubt it is... The same reason that capitalists can never cooperate to save capitalism is that even when you see that it is in the interests of capital as a whole for, you know, I don't know, say corporation tax to go up and there to be greater wealth transfers to working people because it would boost demand and expand the size of the economy or for there to be greater regulation to prevent, you know, the complete and utter destruction of the natural environment upon which capital accumulation depends. They can't cooperate because competition militates against that kind of cooperation. The points at which they can cooperate are the points at which you get monopolies emerging. And at that point, you aren't seeing the competition necessarily generated between the, the main competition being generated between firms, but between states. And then you start to see that same dynamic Trans transpiring at the international level. It's that even if it would be in the interest of all of these states to cooperate together in order to save global capitalism, you know, what we've seen in the trade in the trade war is that Trump saw that as very much a zero sum game. It wasn't we're both going to be better off or we're both going to be worse off. It's I'm going to start this war that is going to make us both worse off but I will be less worse off than you at the end of it. The American economy will be damaged less by this trade war than the Chinese economy. That zero-sum logic of inter interstate competition is just as much as true on the economic terrain today as it has been historically, you know, in military or political terms. So I don't know. I don't know if, if you're going to see, say, you know, the Fed extending the option of those dollar swap lines to the Chinese economy and what China will do if it does need to access that that dollar liquidity. As two says in the article, will it just sell off all those treasuries? If so, that completely screws the US. So it will be very, very interesting to see what happens here. You know, yes, we are entering an era where the interests of capital and the state are increasingly fused. But to what extent are we seeing the interests of states being fused? In many ways, after 
several decades of growing collaboration between states, we're seeing that break down, perhaps because of the dynamics of, of the global economy, perhaps because we are entering this, or we've been in this period of stagnation, and now we're entering this period of crisis. So yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not optimistic, but then again, I am optimistic because all of the kind of escalating contradictions that are going to become so obviously manifested during these crises are going to expand the horizons of people who say we can do things differently. Well, let's talk a little about just that, about how the left should be thinking about this crisis. As Marx once put it, we we humans do make history, but not under conditions of our own choosing. But what happens in crises is that conditions change dramatically and quickly. Explain the Marxist theory of crisis, how crisis emerges at this intersection of economics, politics, people's daily lives. Why, as you write, quote, everything becomes more contingent and what that all teaches us about what we can make possible and achieve during the crisis. You write, quote, we cannot wait for capitalism to fail and socialism to replace it. But equally, we cannot force our way towards a socialist society if the technological conditions, economic outputs, and, most important, the power relations that would support it are not already starting to emerge. Explain this debate over structure and agency, how, how you see things, and what that tells us about what, as one wise man once put it, is to be done. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I'll explain my understanding and my interpretation of this, um, because it's obviously hotly debated and contested. Uh, there are those who think that, you know, so thinking about structure and agency, thinking about the base and superstructure, you know, in Marx's terms, Marx would say there's the technological and economic base, you know, the material conditions of existence. And then there are superstructures, ideological, political institutions, cultural norms, whatever, and some people think that Marx had a very deterministic view about the relationship between these two, these two areas. So that basically the economic base, so what's going on in the economy, completely determines the terrain of institutions, politics, culture, etc. Um, and this kind of maps on to some extent to this culture agent, uh, sorry, structure agency dynamic. So that there are you know broad economic technological structures that largely stem from the economic base that determine a whole bunch of stuff so that determine how we produce things how we circulate things how we make decisions who has power etc and then the way that we can act in response to these conditions so the way we can maybe construct institutions or norms or organize to shift those structural power relations um, is very limited or even non-existent, you know, everything that happens, everything we think, do, say is just determined by the broad structures of the economy. The other kind of more postmodern or post-structuralist perspective is that human beings are free. We are completely free. And, you know, you can see currents of this in, say, like existentialist thinking, right, that our lives are just the result of an accumulation of, of, of decisions and choices that are entirely of our it within our you know grasp to to determine and to alter and you you see this emerging a little bit in amongst the post structuralists in the 1990s and noughties they're pushing back against this deterministic view of human nature that they say kind of occludes human freedom and agency and turns people into automatons when actually they're free and it's insulting and whatever now you know i think most people talking about looking at this debate you know the average person looking at this debate would say there is obviously a bit of both here. We are, you know, um, we make history, but not in the conditions of our of our choosing. People are free to make certain decisions, but the context in which they're making those decisions, the resources they have available, the options they have open to them, are determined to a greater or lesser extent by these structures, these, uh, you know, big deterministic technological economic conditions, and also even based on elements of the superstructure, right, by political conditions, by all these different sorts of things. So the question about how those things interact during periods of calm versus periods of crisis is important because I think, you know, the relationship is not always 
the same. During moments of stability, when, you know, the economic base is kind of trundling along just fine, you're getting economic growth, you're getting technological development, and political institutions as a result seem fairly stable. There is a widespread kind of ideological basis to what's going on. So, you know, everyone buys into a similar sort of narrative, similar sort of cultural norms, etc., similar mechanisms of sense making. Then, all, you know, there is almost less scope for agency in the sense of being able to really change and shift some of those bigger structures and institutions, um, you know, particularly when it comes to, say, political institutions, for example. It's during moments of crisis. So when, you know, the economic base begins to, uh, you know, when the contradictions um, within the mode of production begin to manifest itself and contradiction is this idea of contradiction is really important to Marxist thinking because obviously the idea is that there are inherent trends within capitalism that generate crises from within the system so not these exogenous shocks that economists talk about but inherent contradictions and crises so yeah the the kind of contradictions inherent in capitalism ultimately lead to these moments of, of crisis of breakdown where you know the basic structures stop working in the way that they once did. And that also manifests itself in our political institutions, in our sense making, in culture, in all these different ways. And during those moments, you know, you can see in the sense that political and cultural institutions are in any way related to the economic base. And you can argue that they're determined by them. You can argue that they're just influenced by them, whatever. But in the sense they have any relationship when you start to see these cracks emerging in in the economic base, you also start seeing cracks emerging in these cultural, political, social institutions. And when that begins to happen, there are obviously ways for people to be able to organize to influence those political, social and economic institutions. And also, to an extent, ways for people to organize to even influence the, the trajectory of the economic base. So how the actual economy works, how the relations of production work, even what kind of technology we're developing and how it develops. Um, because precisely because that stability that emerges from those periods of growth has broken down. And that's what I mean when I say moments of crisis and moments of contingency, because they're moments where you can kind of get in the interstices of capitalist institutions, of capitalism itself, and begin organizing to shift things. And it's those moments like, you know, the moment between 2008 and, and now, you know, we're still in that moment, really. The, the same moment in the 1970s, the moment after the Second World War, people start asking fundamental questions about what kind of society they want to live in, and they start organizing to change it. And I think that we really are in one of those moments right now. Trump and Brexit and Johnson's victory over Corbyn's Labour Party are all, of course, in different ways, manifestations of how the politics of the 2008 crisis have played out, typically to the right's benefit. My last question is, why has the populist right benefited in a way that a resurgent populist left has failed to? Is it simply because the populist right has the easier job at the end of the day of governing for rather than against capital? I, I'm wary of too much second guessing, at least in the case of the U.S., because the Bernie movement has done more to change politics here than anything else that we on the American left has tried for a very long time. But 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 what should we be making of what's happened and what's happening? Were, were conditions wrong or was the strategy wrong or some of both? And might this current crisis produce conditions that are somehow more favorable? I think really what's happened with the left over the last 10 years has been that it's been a, a, an inversion of the historical trend when it comes to how social change has happened in that historically you've had the development of certain social forces and that has stemmed in one way or another from the changing nature of capitalism itself. So, you know, the emergence of the labor movement, for example, the labor movement emerges, begins to organize politically, forms political parties, stands in elections and changes things that way. And you have a steady ratcheting up in the, the kind of demands being made by the labor movement, you know, related social movements by these forces in society that are pushing for things to change. And that eventually manifests itself in changes in electoral politics. Over the last 10 years, we've had a massive focus on electoral politics and basically a completely hollowed out 
um, set of social forces underneath that because of the long term evisceration of the labor movement, because of all the, uh, I suppose, I don't want to say failures necessarily, but maybe um, the lack of organization amongst other kind of social movements that many thought might be able to to fill this gap because of the individualization that we've seen in society and the erosion of our collective identity and social institutions. All of this has meant that everyone immediately, as soon as the crisis happened, realized something was wrong. Eventually, they something they realized something was really, really wrong. But that didn't first manifest itself as a wave of industrial action. It didn't, you know, it did to an extent manifest itself as a wave of protest, but that didn't necessarily translate into a big organized social force. Instead, all that energy was directed into electoral politics with Sanders and Corbyn. And on the one hand, that was amazing because it it allowed things to change more rapidly in the realm of politics and discourse than otherwise would have been the case. But it left a big gap because it meant that these these guys, Sanders and Corbyn, were kind of floating um, up above the the realm of civil society, I suppose, just in the realm of electoral politics without solid roots in a in a social movement in a in the labor movement in any kind of grassroots movement now there were attempts to build that movement up behind the emergence of these candidates right so the moment like momentum the dsa twt the emergence of these forms of political organization attempts to organize everyone who voted for corbyn into a more coherent block but it was still very much a cart before the horse situation yes exactly and we just didn't have the time to translate that into into a more coherent strategy. And obviously, you know, then you have why this failed in the realm of electoral politics, which I think is basically comes down to capitalist realism for me. That's the most profound thing. It's the idea that people know things are bad, but they don't believe that they could be better. Um, And until they believe that they can be better, the only way you get people to realize that things could be different is when they start engaging in collective struggle. And that is why that element of it is so important. It's when people start challenging the system themselves on a you know collective basis that they think, right, things could be different because we, we are so individualized as a society and because you know the ideology that um, underpins capitalism is so strong, most people were just like, yeah, I mean, all this sounds nice, but we don't believe that you're going to be able to deliver it. And I think you had a similar dynamic with Bernie in the US. Yeah, universal healthcare would be nice, but we can't afford it or it's not sensible, or he's too radical, or whatever. All of these things, I think, emerge from the dynamics of this, what Mark Fisher calls capitalist realism, it's the idea that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And even just, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than like the transition from neoliberalism to social democracy. Um, <laughs> so, you know, to an extent, we've we've eroded that over the last 10 years, but we haven't done enough to organize people. And that's where the real problem is. And now with coronavirus, we seem to be entering capitalist surrealism. Does that change anything? Yeah, we ha- we are. I mean, that's a good way of putting it. But also, I think what we're going to see is new social institutions and new forms of collective solidarity emerge as a result of this crisis. People are, as they always do during moments of crisis, going to have each other's backs. They're going to do that um, economically. They're going to do it socially. They're going to volunteer. They're going to help people out in their communities. And that is going to do something pretty profound to the individualism that underpins our collective pessimism about the possibility of building a a new kind of society. Um, You know, if anything, I think it has the potential to really make us realize that if we work together, we could live in a very different world. And that really, you know, it sounds idealistic and, you know, maybe even naive if you have a very cynical view of human nature but that really is the foundation of socialism it's that we can when we you know the vast majority of people work together overthrow this order that is constructed by and benefits the tiny elite at the very top and build something collectively that is rational that is efficient and that is just optimism of the will grace blakely thank you very very much thank you for having me Grace Blakely is a Marxist economist and the author of Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. She is a staff writer at Tribune magazine and sits on the Labor Party's National Policy Forum. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that 
capital is reckless of the health or length of life of the laborer, unless under compulsion from society. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Riofrancos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. And please do find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes or wherever, please do leave us a nice review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. But what really and truly does that is you telling people you know about the show. Right now, a lot of people are looking for new podcasts. Tell them about The Dig. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge. Thank you.